to stay with the concern on traffic. And I'm like, you liked it, but you want to stay on the concern of traffic. I get it. Because we had a huge group here that was arguing traffic, traffic, traffic to the school. And there was probably 15 people here that night that were all up in arms about increased traffic. Um, that's on the Fairfield Road side. Well, there's two components I'll address. One is we're actually going to open up a corridor between uh, Fairfield and Pony Express, which is going to be the first time people can get off of that road and come the other way. Secondly, when your bypass comes through, when Foothill comes through, uh, I think it's Foothill. I'm trying to remember the name of that. Uh, when it comes through, it's actually going to stop you before you get to the school. So people are going to be forced to pony to go around with vehicular traffic. And so it's very short term that that traffic problem across there is going to exist. But it's also going to cut all of our traffic coming the opposite direction to the commercial area. So we're really stuck to only Pony Express as our draw. And, that's, and we're on a main road with only one intersection. So we kind of designed this to optimize your goals, we feel, from staff's review and everything. In fact, if you've read through the packet, which I presume you have, you'll find that the staff is complimentary. Your economic development person was very complimentary, said, I think this will be viable, it'll vibrant, it'll work. It's something the town could benefit from. Uh, we had a positive staff review at the Planning Commission, and it was just one of those things where the audience and the energy and everything kind of went against us a little bit, but one of them stayed with us to the end. Um, I think at this point, I would like to take any questions that you might have. Um, sorry, I took a little bit longer, but I hope it was helpful information um, that may have complimented the packet that you have right now. We are compliant to all of your zoning for the MF10, uh, each of the different components there. So we just are rezoning to an existing zone. We're not trying to change anything there. And um, the development agreement does tie the fact that our entire horizontals improvements and pads have to be put in. That was the other legitimate, very good concern your planning commission had, which I was very impressed with them, actually, the questions. They were like, well, often we'll give you that, then you won't come and put the commercial in. And we voluntarily said we will be available to a, we'll be amenable to a development agreement that will require that to be done before we can move into the residential component. Um, we do see them as tied together in our world. So thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you. Um, just because... I think we've all been there. Uh, when you're remote, you never get to say anything. Wilden, do you have anything that you want to ask or anything you want to add before we start? Um, why don't we go around the, the table? Those are in person because I think there's some okay. hand that I couldn't see. Um, so I'd, I'd appreciate feedback, comments from the council in okay. person. Council McComber. So I appreciate the presentation that you did give and the background and the details. Um, my microphone, I don't think is working. There it goes. It's, I think it's, oh, Steven, I've got your microphone today. It sucks. But um, so I'm looking at this and commercial is really important. You mentioned that. Um, we, but we want commercial to be viable. And I get what you're saying too. Um, you keep saying you only have Pony Express. You do realize that long term, it's over 100,000 people from Eagle Mountain coming through on Pony Express and the Pioneer Crossing, but most of it is on this side. So Pony Express is going to be a substantial road. So you're going to have a lot of eyes on your development. So I, I think it needs to be really clear, like it's, this is going to be just like a Redwood Road currently in the next 20 years. But so um, I'm looking at this and I'm going eight buildings attached. So I've been on the city council for 13 years. I've seen every development. I saw the apartments come in. They had entitlements. Everything's come through. We really work hard to not make walls. And with what you've created in your design here is a huge wall between your commercial and your residential with eight and seven units that have no break in between them. It's seven units all connected, eight units all connected. In fact, the smallest one is a five unit building. These are very big, cumbersome, seven, eight. That's a huge structure. And I know you try and do it. With, I appreciated the design. I did notice that you had some angles. And you're trying to make, the, but it's still garage, 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 garage. Lots of cars. Like it's it's very very dense. Um, I am not a fan of high density at all. And this to me feels very high dense. Um, one of my things is if I ever have approved or agreed to any kind of density, um, there has to be substantial value add to the city. 
perfect example, just in the last year, maybe a year and a half, we had we got an entire new marina and a huge park dedicated to the city for some density um, in part of the city. And so, and a tra tra uh, traffic corridor, a major new traffic corridor that's going to be coming in the next 20 years. And so they left an easement and stuff. So a lot of concessions were given. I get that you're talking about burying that 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 trail there and making the trail and burying the canal. Um, to me, I, that does not meet the level of, for me personally, um, I just, and then if you look on the other side, um, I don't, cause I don't have a problem necessarily where the, the mountain, this is going to be the freeway, the mountain view corridor freeway. It's not just foothill. This is foothill, freeway, foothill. Um, that we have some multifamily housing. This is not a bad location, generally speaking. I just feel that this is extremely dense and it's a big ask and I don't like the number of buildings all piled in on each other. Now, I know that this isn't the purpose, but I just want to give kudos. This commercial plan that you do have here, I know that we're not talking about today, very well thought out. I was looking at it, looking at how you're doing your parking lots, very impressed. So, but just for me personally, my vote is, is because of the density and the big walls of buildings that are going to be um, backing onto that commercial. I just can't can't support that. Thank you. So I, I agree with Councilman Comber uh, with quite a bit of what he said. Uh, one thing you said in your presentation that made me go look is the parcel to the east, which, we, which you mentioned would be the next commercial plat, is actually in our land use map, low density residential. So we'd have community commercial this higher density residential, and then low density residential, and then Lexington Green is the next one over. So it doesn't flow very well with that addition. I, I would prefer to keep that community commercial with a low density residential and then Lexington Green next to the Mountain View Corridor. Uh, when I look at that, and we just adopted that land use map again just recently, and that, it was that before. Um, And that's all I've got for right now. Okay. Councilman Podesca. Is that working? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the presentation as well. That uh, cleared up uh, a couple items that I was going to ask about. Uh, as far as like the, the entrance with the, uh, that right in, right out, uh, I understand like ideally it's, it's nice to have another full entrance on that east side. Uh, just doing a couple of measurements with other commercial within our city. Um, it fairly fits without having that right in, right out, uh, about the same amount of distance from the main entrance uh, to that commercial if it was back in that area where the residential, where the proposed residential is. Uh, so as far as, yeah, kind of Councilman Cumber's points, uh, the amount of visibility from Pony Express to see what businesses were there uh, and then the access for them to, to go at the stoplights if they're coming from Eagle Mountain. Uh, I, I still see that as a viable um, viable entrance there. And, and so just because with, as Councilman Karn was mentioning too, just looking at the zoning around it, um, it just doesn't seem to kind of do that feathering that we're talking about uh, with other developments. Uh, that's, that's the only comments I have. Councilman, did you have anything to add? Yeah, thank you. I, I was under the impression there was like a handout, so I apologize. Uh, my comments haven't changed. But I, I appreciate everyone's uh, feedback uh, going ahead of me. I'll just say, I mean, the presentation was very well done. Um, you know, and I understand the reason for the proposal, but the, the reality is this is a legislative decision. And like Councilman McComber said, um, unless there's significant benefit to the city, um, we just don't typically just upgrade rezones. And when I say we don't typically, we never do. And, and a real concern I have here is I know we're not talking about a significant number of units, but the voters in this area, well, not this area, other areas of the Alpine School District area decided to vote down a bond. And so we have a significant concern with the ability to have enough schools to support this. So right now I'm incredibly hesitant to compound the problem we have with schools and 
approve legislatively increased density um, because we really do have a real problem with that. And this will bring more, uh, more individuals uh, and potentially children for the schools that we don't have capacity for now and it's not zoned that way. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Um, as far as my comments, I think that they, uh, they tend to mirror what's already been said. Um, yeah, I've, I've never been a fan of rezoning commercial um, into residential. We've done that over and over again in the past and it's really kind of put us under behind the eight ball as far as having enough commercial. I understand as a developer coming in today, uh, you may not see it as viable across the entire property, um, but we have to think 20 years in the future and, and 20 years in the future, we're gonna need the, the, that commercial acreage. And if it's got houses on it, we're not gonna get it. Um, I, I, I do understand your, uh, the idea of, of the, the residential, you know, complementing some of the businesses, uh, the types of businesses you're, you're looking to bring into this concept plan. Um, but I mean, we have several hundred homes uh, within walking distance of, of this, um, you know, just, just over the hill uh, to, your, uh, to your west, as well as uh, the Lexington Green property, whatever comes in, inter, inter, intervening space, as well as the homes that are going in, um, as well as my neighborhood. Um, I could, you know, right. I, I, I could walk down to this from my, from my house. So, um, and that's another 500 homes that, you know, between us and, and Sunrise Meadows. So, um, I, I, I don't know that, uh, what is it? Nine, nine buildings of townhomes is going to make you more viable than, than you already are. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming down on that. Um, I do agree with what was said about about the commercial um, side. I know that we're talking about the the eastern parcel today, but um, I'm I'm very pleased with with the uh, the layout of the commercial side. I think it's going to be a great a great product. It's going to be a great addition to our city. I think it's you're going to find it's much more successful than you think it might be. Um, our our city and our residents, as well as thankfully uh, Eagle Mountains residents, are very good at patronizing business in Saratoga Springs. So. Um, they all, you know, we, we consistently open up the number one business in, in the region. Every time somebody opens up out here, they, they instantly shoot to the top of the chart. So, <laughs> so um, I guess if, if, is there any, anything else that you'd like to say in response to what you've heard? Sure, I'd like to. Um, first of all, I uh, want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, too, I want to appreciate your compliments and discussions about our commercial design. Um, the challenge, of course, as a developer is that we package something together as a product, and this has a package component of the type of development being a residential commercial mix type development that has a market for that when we go to try to put this together and create it in a timely fashion. Um, here, going in and putting in just commercial and then we don't argue that there won't be a viability at some point in the future, possibly for that to be commercial. I uh, don't know that we will actually design or move forward with anything there anytime in the near future. Uh, at, if we don't do, you know, the package and, and I don't, I don't know that we'll change the design or layout. Um, the product we're putting to the left is, is um, well, you, you can call it a little higher end when you're looking at what we're trying to put in there, commercial-wise. Uh, you're talking about type A office space that'll be up in some of the places. We're talking about really dressing it up. And um, the combination of the two, if you look through this, creating communities, a guide to walkable, if you look through your entire Saratoga plan about walkable communities, combining families and commercial, and you know, you're kind of islandized yourself into commercial and residential as a town. And you've got a lot of ground still to be done with what the church has got and everybody coming in to have the chance to start blending some of that and coming into the next modern type of iteration of design and development, which is what we were hopeful you would be amenable to. Um, I would even invite 
um, knowing that I would probably come back with a very shorter conversation and have a very brief response. But I would even entertain um, asking if y'all would even look at tabling the item for today and then just thinking about it for a month. Um, any other questions you might have and then telling me no in January. Um, you know, or if there's anything I could rechange change this, this residential is the elements of the comments coming back to us. We, like in North Ogden, we took 25 buildings, we turned them into 12, and we created a, a wonderful park area and a lot of amenities that were different, and they loved it, and then they didn't want the bigger build. I mean, we don't have to have seven connected buildings. I mean, we can rearrange them. We can put 60 unit, 59 units, which isn't a lot, but it's substantial to what we're doing, because you're talking about 3.5 people per unit. You know, you look at how many people are right there next door to all your businesses. It's, it's a viable thing, but we will take feedback on if you will go to a different product style. If you, I mean, we don't mind making the multi, you know, concept as long as we had that type of a quantity of ability to work with. We could adapt it in-house to whatever might be suitable to council. We just don't have the liberty of approaching or having conversations with you till tonight. So um, if that liberty exists and you would be willing to table it, uh, think about it. We take some of the feedback that you provided from the bench, uh, go look at it again for a month, and then we could just come back by, run it by you, because we also want to see if it would change any of our commercial a little bit. Um, I don't feel that it will. I'm not trying to make that the condition by any means. We were taking the condition to do the A agreement, to do all the other things you wanted, as far as like Fairfield Road, the park system, the trails, all that was kind of tied to, if you want this, you have to do all these things. Um, if you if we don't do the DA agreement, then we would go to a commercial product and it lessens our upfront costs for some of these other items. So for us, it's really, we're going to love being in your town either way. I promise we're not here leaving disappointed. We're excited to come to Saratoga. I mean, in fact, our project, our superintendent for all of our construction is the one living on this parcel right now. <laughs> so you'll have a nativity scene for everybody to go to tomorrow night, I think. So we've been in the community for a while uh, with one of our residents. So it's not an objective to get apartments. It's not an objective to get multi-housing in the wrong way. It's not an objective to make D, make the big D be density. It's, it's about providing products that don't exist in the market right now that people are desiring that don't really want a single family home with a yard that's 10 feet big and right beside each other. And they don't really have the ability to walk out and have a park and a pickleball court and a place to kick a soccer ball and throw a ball with their son. They just are stuck in a small home because that's all that's getting zoned is if it's residential and it's a small lot, we'll take it because it meets the rule. Here we're trying to say, let's be rule breakers, but towards the benefit of community. And let's reassess what that whole parkway is going to look like because the argument, not the argument, the statement about that next door property being low residential that's not a low residential spot when you look at the design and where Saratoga's headed. That needs to be something different, even a little different type of a residential product against all the commercial and the traffic and everything's going to be there. It's just been that way for a while, but it would be as, you know, coming off the other entrance into that direction would be a suitable commercial too. But that's going to come as time goes. We're with you. We're with you through this project, you know, with our commercial component. So if you're willing to and you'd like to think on it, sleep on it for a little bit, let us come back for a few minutes. I'll keep my presentation really short next time. <laughs> if, if that's a plausible uh, motion that you might be willing to make. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm not opposed to the concept of tabling this and I'm happy to meet with a developer. Uh, if there's another council member that is, could have some time to do that over the next, uh, we don't, we've got another meeting in January. Yeah. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I'd have to see a substantial reduction in density um, to consider a change, but uh, that's something I can commit to. Um, I'm, if nobody else is, I probably have time, but, um, but if other people are interested, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> You guys can do it because for me personally, I'd have to see a substantial reduction. You actually, 
I don't know if you meant to do it, but you hurt your argument because you said the next one over should be commercial, so then we should just have this whole thing. <laughs> so, just not low density, kind of residential. That was all I was thinking, but I appreciate that. Residential, commercial, <laughs> identity residential. So for me, if I was to have that as a residential, but you're saying that maybe that's not the best, and I'd see a 25% reduction here because then I'm feathering from neighborhood commercial, a very low, a very low density housing, um, and definitely not eight buildings to connect it. I mean, you, I'm very good doing this for 13 years. Yeah. I look at that and I can see the, what it looks like from the road. I can see what that looks like. And I went and looked at the elevation changes as well. And it's going to be a wall. And your, some of your design, we do really good on the front part and we don't always do good designs on the back parts of our <laughs> buildings. And we do have rules around that. But but just for me, that would have to be a much bigger reduction. Um, but I actually would rather, if anything, we come back and we do a land use change and say that that residential goes to a neighborhood commercial as well, up the zone, make that community community commercial. We used to call it neighborhood commercial. <laughs> so the lot to the east. east. So then we have commercial, and then we'd have maybe the right in, right out in the middle, a lighted, and then they'd have access again on the other side with a light. So then they're... So almost like what you see in uh, along Redwood Road in some sense. Thank you. We just welcome the conversation if we can have it. That would be great. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm ready to vote on this today. But if you, if they want to do that, the vote goes that way. Um, okay. Bit. For me, density has to be. There has to be a really good reason. Okay. Thank you. So uh, a couple things. First of all, um, I, knowing the property owner. Um, that's on the other side of the canal, I, I don't think we're going to be having a density conversation. Um, <laughs> not for a while. Not for a long time. Um, but, but I also want to point out Lexington Green, if you remember, it does have the higher density closer to the, the, the Mountain View corridor. And then it goes to single family housing. So it already has transitioned into single family housing. And so I, I, I you know, from, a, from a, a feathering concept, you're probably looking at that property not developing for a good while. But when it does, it probably would, would mirror that, that other density. It could mirror that other density. Obviously, the general plan is something that you could amend. I would encourage, if you'd like, you know, f we'll certainly help facilitate setting up that meeting for you if, uh, if that's the direction you want to go. It, if I may, I mean, you know, I'm open to tabling it if that's something Councilman Karn and Porter are interested in doing to accommodate them. Um, you know, and I certainly appreciate the presentation. It's well done. I, I would just say we mentioned, hey, this isn't a product available. There's a significant amount of townhomes available in the city. Um, and, and it really goes to Councilman McComber's point is it really needs to be a significant benefit to the city for me to see that. But again, I'm willing to table it if uh, the two other council members are interested in doing that. I'm not like Councilman McComber. I'm not particularly um, interested at this time. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll hit the button. I'll entertain a motion. I move that we deny the Rider Station General Plan Land Use Map Amendment from Community Commercial to Medium Density Residential Rezone from Community Commercial to uh, MF10 and the Development Agreement as listed in the as item two in business items. I have a first from Councilman McConnell. Is there a second? Can we clarify the, I, I couldn't hear the first part of your motion. So I'm not, I, I'm, there I go, wait. And yeah, I'm actually voting their request down. I'm not tabling it. Okay, I'll second. I have a second from Councilman Wilden. Is there any further discussion? So, but there, you two are willing to to meet with them, and I just don't want to use back. staff time. Can I uh, sh sure. Additional comment to the motion. Yeah, as long as it's on Thanks. the motion. Thanks. So the, my comment was just that they are always welcome to apply for a separate rezone. So this is an M, this is a request for MF10, and, and that's what's on the table. A lower density would be a different zone. That was all I wanted to add. Thank you. And, and so that would be another application that they have to do to do a different zone request? They'd have to do it anyway. Okay. Oh, it would have to be another application. Right, because they are requesting it with this application. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Um, Councilman Wilden. Aye. Councilman Podesca. Aye. Councilman Karn. Because of that comment, aye. Councilman McComber. Aye. Councilman Porter, nay. The motion passes 4-1. Propose another concept. Are you still willing to be happy yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate just the feedback on our commercial concept as we go. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, next is business item three, code amendment title nineteen uh, dot twenty, internal accessory dwelling units. Oh, sorry. I'm not All used right. to having to push buttons. <laughs> uh, Council, this is uh, another in a series of amendments regarding IEDU, trying to further perfect our code. Uh, as we looked at our processes for review, we felt that there was a need for clarifying specifically what should happen in the review of an application to amend our map. Uh, so we're calling out uh, not only the, uh, the city engineer, um, let's see, we've got the wrong. Which, which item is this? This is uh, item three IEDUs. IEDUs, yeah. Sorry, we had the wrong. There it is. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the first couple of amendments that are being shown on this first slide are just uh, some uh, improvements, I believe, uh, in the verbiage, just saying that uh, the map is identified on the city's website and that if uh, someone wants to amend the, the neighborhood map or the IEDU map, that it uh, can be not only for IEDU prohibited areas, but for residential zoning with IEDU potential so that we can go through the same process uh, regardless of, you know, if, if it's already approved, then we're good. If it's not approved, but it's potential, then we should go through this process. Um, so then we're looking for uh, both the city uh, fire marshal and city engineering staff shall uh, review all of these applications um, in, in regard, in, of course, uh, uh, in addition to planning. But uh, we've called out the, the specifically what we're looking for, that to re recommend to city council conditions of approval based on the fire code or engineering standards related to traffic, roadway, infrastructure, or safety issues created by IADUs being allowed in the respective neighborhood or subdivision. It also calls out uh, that the applicant shall submit a report to provide this information uh, from whatever they have. So I think we're giving greater guidance both for the applicant and for staff in performing their reviews. So that's basically it. Um, this has been reviewed by Planning Commission with positive recommendation. All right. Are there any questions from council? Uh, my only question on this is, do we have, oh, sorry. <laughs> do we have a layer in our maps that show I, IEDUs yet? Yes. So in our city map, Oh, yeah, are you the asking? The GIS map. The GIS maps, like Mark, you know what I'm talking You're about? Is there, is there a layer I can turn on to show ID? Yeah, uh, Just an overlay for where they, they're allowed, where they're not. Where, yes. I'm so, being told yes over there in the corner. Like on uh, field notes, meter routes, TRS, it's the, the longest description. Yeah. Have a pull down drop down menu, and then about <laughs> 10 items down, you'll find ID classification. I don't know why you can't find it, Card. <laughs> Slacker. So easy to find. Right. Yeah. That's fine. It's there though. It's like to tease a little. Well, All right. It's about political boundaries. If that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, are there any other questions? I'll entertain a motion. No. I've been doing all of them. I'll move. I'll move. To I have to entertain them. I can't. Title 19 oh. dot 20 internal accessory dwelling unit. And 
I'm not on. You're good. Just be really loud. You're, no, you're, you're on. on. I'm on. Yeah. Just on that item number three. I was listening on the agenda. Second. I have a first from Councilman McComber and a second from Councilman Karn. Is there any further discussion on the item? Councilman Podesca. Aye. Councilman McComber. Aye. Councilman Karn. Aye. Councilman Wilden. Aye. Councilman Porter. Aye. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Excuse me real quickly, if I could. One of the things that I want to point out on this, if you recall during our general plan update recently, we included this as part of our moderate income housing plan report. Um, we've received notice from the state that they'd like us to add some additional clarification as far as our goals as well and objectives and other things as far as moving this forward. So we're going to be looking to have an amendment to our general plan to include different types of measures and other things to get the state's uh, moderate income housing report um, satisfactory. So this will be one of the items that we'll address in that. I just wanted to bring that up just as a note and be aware that um, we're holding, we're gonna try and hold a special planning commission meeting to, to make that amendment. It'll be an addendum to our general plan update. And then you'll see that the first week of January in an effort to try and get this completed prior to the legislative session. Does that check the box to make it measurable? Yes, we'll, we'll, also, we'll also include some other measures in that the other, process. The other stuff they mentioned in the yes, letter. Okay. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention. It brings us to compliance. Yeah, yeah that's where our hope okay. is. Yeah. Are we gonna need, do we need to have a meeting outside the planning commission to do it? No, um, we'll, we'll, we'll attack it in our first. January you know, 3rd is before the session. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I don't start till the 20th. Thank you for that digression. Please start. 20th, I think. <coughs> it's around the 20th. Yeah. They start the third Tuesday, the first Tuesday. Of why that's only to turn them on okay i'm learning i'm learning all right uh business item four code of amendment 19.020405 accessory structures not <laughs> dwelling units not internal <laughs> external that's right okay so uh the council i'm sure is aware of some of the issues that we had with accessory structures recently or earlier this year and so this has been an attempt to try to put a stop to the issues that, uh, that have come forward in regards to approving something that doesn't fit in a residential area. So what we've done is uh, we've looked at our accessory buildings and structures. Uh, some of in the ordinance that you have before you are several pages of just minor uh, verbiage of including structures uh, with buildings and such so that we're kind of being consistent throughout the, the ordinance. But the meat of what we're looking at here is uh, as shown on the screen, we're looking at um, the maximum building height uh, with a footprint of 200 square feet and over shall be 25 feet or the height of the primary structure, whichever is more restrictive. So we're looking at the overall, overall massing of the structure, um, uh, except for those uh, smaller sheds that are, uh, fit, that are two, uh, under 200 square feet, which does not require a building permit. Right. Okay, and so uh, again, what we're trying to accomplish is this, not that. Um, so visually, that's, that's what the verbiage is trying to achieve. So architecturally, what we've uh, added in here is buildings over 200 square feet shall be built of uh, durable materials except metal on exterior walls and shall include a wainscot siding or similar architectural feature covering a minimum of 30% of all building sides except door areas made of similar materials used on the primary structure. And then also adding verbiage about um, that it cannot be located over a PUE unless there's an, encro an encroachment approved. So I think uh, this is going to give greater uh, guidance to uh, staff's review as well as uh, to the applicant when they look at what they are applying for. No, I just think this is really good cleanup. It's gonna like make code enforcement more clear. There won't be Ambiguity, and whenever we can reduce ambiguity, that. Um, can I ask one question? Yeah, go ahead, Councilman Wood. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure, you know, we remove the language in here regarding building permits. We're not triggering something if it's a small shed under 200 feet that it's going to trigger. You still have to get a building permit because I'd hate for someone to go and get a you know, a tough shed or something like that from Home Depot and then have to go and get a building permit. So, Stephen, just, you know, because you can't see the screens, um, they've, they've struck that language that would require the building permit. 
Yeah, I, sorry, I can see that. It just says or 15 feet buildings not requiring a building permit. It, they, everything regarding building permit has been stripped. Yeah. Is there another place in code that references the need to well, not have a building permit for smaller buildings? Building code itself, they, they will not issue a permit for anything under 200 square feet. So what we're just saying here is so that it's not ambiguous, we're in our planning code. <coughs> Yep. That, okay. That that answers it. I just wanted to make sure that it was we weren't residents weren't losing that ability. So instead of saying a, a building that doesn't require a building permit, we wanted to say what that is. It's a building that's under square. I would say leave it out of the code and just default to the building code. Yeah. Building code is going to regulate it. Don't don't mention it at all. Well, the reason why we have it here is we're, we're doing the 15 foot height. So we're talking about the height in the paragraph so we have two different heights 25 foot maximum on the one and 15 on the other if it's a bit redundant I see it being beneficial in this case yeah I agree right. on that no I'm ready to make a motion I move to approve business item four code amendment titles 19-02 1904 and 1905 accessory structures city initiated citywide ordinance 22-53 dated today with any additional findings <coughs> I second I have a first from councilman Karn a second from councilman Podesta is there any further discussion on the item can I can I ask a quick question yeah what would happen if the primary building is a metal a metal building I don't think we have very many of those anymore but let's say it's a it's an old you know agricultural residence farmhouse that has a metal metal building on the exterior and if it's if it's supposed to match the primary residence they wouldn't be but metal is not allowed what are they supposed to do in in that case something similar <laughs> i just the thought came to me can't we like list number of materials that are approved and that I, I don't think we have very many of those buildings, but just in case we did, I don't know how the code would be met. I just threw a fly in the ointment. All right. Another technicality is we have 200 square feet or over, and then we have 200 square feet or less. So if you have a building that's exactly 200 square feet, is it what applies? So one of those needs to be less than or equal to? It says square feet or less, 200 square feet or it, less. It may be the uh, slide and is over. Not, oh, oh, uh, higher, Kevin. Yeah, it's, it's the other one says 200 square feet and over. So yeah. they're both that seems equal fine. to 200. Oh. They both have a little triangle. If you, if you build it exactly 200, you have to do both. Yeah. Well, well we can clean that up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can direct us to. Okay, so uh, uh, amend the motion to clean up the language that we just discussed. All right. A second. Uh, we have amended first and second. Any further discussion of the item? Councilman Karn. Aye. Councilman uh, Podeska. Aye. Councilman McComber. Aye. Councilman Wilden. Aye. Councilman Porter. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, business item five, code amendment title 19.05 and no, 18. 1905 one. Not the nuisance one, it's the one before. So no, this one says 05. No, I'm not talking to her. Sorry. Oh, I don't sorry. know if this is. I don't know if it's, this would be. Can I, can I comment real quick? Sure. I'm not even sure if this is um, appropriate, but I, I had a lot of problems with this, and I would move to just table this entire table. business item. Table five. The nuisance code. Okay. Oh. That, that's, the nuisance uh, that's the next one. We're on five. We're on five. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I do agree with. I'm sorry. We'll get to that. Though. Okay, we'll get to that. Hold your horses. I thought I, I had already crossed out five. Very anxious. <laughs> I did. Already said All right. <laughs> we didn't listen to your prayer, Ryan. <laughs> so we're on 1905 we're on and 1918. We're on concise. Business item. <laughs> this one is the um, regulations. It just says regulations. Yeah. Um, maybe this got put up before we were this is the This is the car wash stuff. This is the car wash and the sign, the drive through sign. Okay. Changes. It's okay. It's fine. No worries. Thanks. Ryan's just watching time take away. Because we're not being concise Never getting it on back. purpose. <laughs> we all heard it. You jinxed us. <laughs> when you said that, we all went, oh. 
I'm getting motion sick watching this. I'm going to go ahead and move that we pull uh, business item six, code amendment title 10.10.02, uh, 10.10.03, and 10.11, nuisance city or initiated citywide ordinance 22-15, that we table that um, to have further discussions with staff and May council. Mayor and Council, just real quickly, if you're comfortable with the weed portion of it, you could you could adopt all of it except for the 10.11, which deals with snow removal. Okay. The rest of the nuisance ordinance, if you're comfortable with it, we could move forward with that portion and then bring back or discuss snow removal at another. I, you can amend if you want. So I'll I'll amend, and if we're going to do that, we need to discuss the entire. We we'll discuss the rest of it. So we'll just. I'm going to pull. I, I'd like to pull that. Is it 10.11, Mark? 10.11. Yeah. I'd like to pull 10.11. I'll second that to remove 10.11 for a future table. council member session. All right. Uh, I have a first from Councilman Karn, uh, and a second from Councilman McComber. Councilman Wilden, you have some? Yeah, I like, I, I'm good with pulling it. My preference is it doesn't come back at all. I'm not interested in it. <laughs> My vote will always be no. So... I would prefer to vote that section down now versus having it come back later. Okay. And I'm frankly okay with that. All right. Uh, personally. Would you like to amend your first? Sure. I will. Since we're going to do this now, um, I'd like to, I, I'm going to pull my motion out. That's it. Okay. And I'll second that. Okay. Right. And then we'll talk about that when it comes up. Okay. Do you have to vote on a pulled motion? <laughs> yeah, you don't. It just fails. It would be majority. I withdraw my motion. I'm going to nay your withdrawal. <laughs> it's a joke. Okay. Uh, you have a lot of code amendments tonight. So <laughs> um, this one is for car wash spacing, uh, water usage, which would essentially require water reuse, and then also for new signage types. So we've combined those into one staff report. Um, what you're seeing here is a proposal for a 5,000 foot spacing uh, for between car washes. Any existing car wash would be grandfathered and this would apply to new applications. And then uh, the water reuse standards we're proposing are 35 gallons. Um, we've looked at other studies other cities have done and that's achievable. Um, it's a gold standard, really, for these car wash, uh, for these full service car washes. Um, without it, they're using about 80. And so essentially, it requires a reuse system to be in, implemented. And that's something that our engineering department would review. And this is a map just displaying the existing car washes that we have and the 5,000 foot spacing and how that would impact uh, the city. And then um, this is the proposed language. There is a question at the bottom of this slide. Um, this has just come up in the last few days regarding sound. Um, we would like you to discuss whether or not we want to implement a distance from residential. And then this, this is an, a graphic um, describing the proposed code code changes related to signage. Right now we allow one menu board, we don't allow preview boards, so we're proposing to allow preview boards that are 75% uh, the size of the main board, and then we're proposing to allow curbside pickup signs for uh, stalls designated for that use. Uh, lots of businesses have them, but we don't have anything in the code right now. Well, we do have preview... <laughs> <laughs> we do have them, but not in the code. So we, um, we see the benefit of those as far as keeping things moving in those drive-through lanes, and then also um, adding some standards for the stalls designated for pickup. 
Uh, that being said, it's it's up to you. All right, Whatever, my name was first. <laughs> Go ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead. Sorry for that. I, so, I know we've had a lot of discussions around this. I'll, I've already started. <laughs> received two comments from potential um, obviously the one uh, mm -hmm. Tommy's that uh, added public input at the beginning and then it, another letter from a separate potential car wash owner was sent to you so I just want to add that on the record that we have two letters in opposition of this spacing yep. requirement and they're 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 entered into the record yes they're entered okay. into the record okay so I'm not anti-car wash um, I know that if I listen to my um, constituents, people think we have a lot of car washes, but if I drive to any car wash after any storm and any day of the week, our car washes have lines that go out and we have demand for more of them, frankly. Um, I do have a question on this because I know that there are, um, are uh, entities who are well into the process. Kevin, can I make a motion on this when it's time that we approve this pending a certain date? Can I make a motion that this goes into effect, say, January 15th? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can specify the effective date of the ordinance, absolutely. So okay. right now, the, the, just the standard form that we have says that the ordinance goes into effect upon uh, publication by the city recorder's office as required by the Utah Code. but. We can amend that and you can specify whatever date that would allow those applicants to get their applications in. Now, if, if they miss that someone date, is 98% of the way there, I, I don't want to technically hurt them because <laughs> they haven't filed it yet. I, I'd, yeah. like, I'd like to get that. And I really like the idea, frankly, of adding the language, Sarah, of um, restricted from residential in the future so that you, know, you could build next to it if you want. Don't have it come in next, next to it in the future. Um, if, but everything else about uh, this ordinance, I, I like, yeah. I would note it. I, would, I also want to mention, too, one thing you, we often need to be careful of is, is applicants who have significant investments that, have, that are far down the road. Of Maybe they haven't officially submitted a complete application, but that's one thing that makes me a little bit uneasy is when there's significant investment back to expectations. Um, as far as distancing and residential, I don't think the Planning Commission heard that, did they? So we would have to obviously bring, that bring go, take that to the Planning Commission. Okay. But yeah, you can specify whatever day you feel okay. comfortable doing that, if, if you choose. So, um, okay, Mike, can you, am I on the microphone? Yeah, you're yeah, good. Okay. So I personally look at this as we have a pending ordinance for a reason. Um, we also have worked really hard on our entry corridor, our making the entrances to our city. We have an overlay that we've been working on. Um, this actually infringes on both of those. This also is within two car washes. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of the car washes and having a half mile distance between them because then we're just going to get that many more applications and none of this is sales tax. This is all we losing, this is taking commercial and we're not even getting sales tax for it. My other big thing is, is ask the South Jordan. I talked to some of the, um, people, the previous city council and the mayor of South Jordan. I just happened to be at a Christmas party, was talking with them. And uh, the last recession, um, they sure as heck didn't like their car washes because they were blight, they were graffitied, they were empty. You can't repurpose a car wash. It is very difficult to turn the car wash into something else. Um, unlike a building, uh, the company goes out of business, you can easily come in and replace that with a different business and repurpose it. Um, it with the car wash, you can't. Uh, you could say, well, maybe another car wash will pick it up and buy it when it's going bankrupt. But when, that, when the recession of 2007, 8, 9, um, they were all empty. And they became really bad um, situations. Uh, people were living in them. Uh, it was just, it was really bad. And they, they were like, whoa, this is not good. Um, I was also at an event where talking to a current city council member from up north, they're actually looking at this exact same kind of thing. And you'll probably get a call from their city administrator because I said, hey, we've done a lot of work on this. You can maybe leverage it. It's pleasant 
Pleasantville, is that what it's called up there? And, uh, Pleasant View, thank you. Um, not the movie. <laughs> yeah, not Pleasantville. Yeah. That's a decent movie. Um, so for me, um, I, I mean, I look at here, I, I appreciate the letter. Um, you knew on November 21st that you were having issues with this zone um, when you were per buying the land that you were going to have a problem with the fact that this had an overlay and other things. So I just am concerned that if you're trying to make it look like you're further down um, the line um, in the process and trying to put pressure on us, um, you could easily take the building structure and the engineering and you can move that to another location. I mean, maybe the parking and how the flow works within the lot, I can see that being a problem. Um, but like when I bought, built my house and when I bought my land two times in Saratoga Springs, I purposely came to the city um, and I said, okay, what's going in around me? What's the, when was the last time that your maps were updated? Because I didn't, wasn't even a city council member at the time. I just knew that you have to do your diligence because you never know. A car wash might move in right behind you, like some people are complaining at holiday going in behind those houses, mm -hmm. right, in the car wash. Um, but I go, that was on the map. Um, and so I, I personally, um, and then I came in before I signed my final papers and did one more check and just said, making sure that uh, it was the Green Springs, you know, <laughs> what's happening with, what's that with Green Springs going on behind my house? It was a big problem in the city years ago. Um, so for me, um, I don't want to have a car wash every half mile in our city. Well, one, we're not a round city. We're a long, skinny city. Um, and yes, right after a storm, but in the summer, you know, there's, I go by the one, by the grocery store, and there's not very many people in line on a regular basis. And it actually sits not even being used. Um, it's just, yeah, a storm does create higher demand, of course. But um, so for me personally, I think that the 5,000 feet makes sense. It's also going to protect us from losing every major corner to another car wash. Um, and then also, I worked pretty hard trying to get the entrance corridor protected. And then we're immediately just putting the, one of the things that's noisy and not what we're trying to accomplish at the entrance to one of the major entrances to the city. Um, and, and we're just overturning it right away. So the purpose of that. So that's where I'm at on this. Yeah, to piggyback on that last comment, that's, that's one of the frustrations I've had with the, our general plan is as we spend all this time planning and lately now this, this gateway zoning, um, but in the past with our, our general plan, it's like we still do piecemeal. We don't really stick to the plan. And, and what was the point of, of uh, zoning in that, in that aspect? Uh, so, so that's the difficult um, situation there is that I mean, for the gateway, it's kind of one of the main reasons was to, to not have car washes at our entrance. I um, appreciate the, the presentation of, of the information here. And if I see it correctly, it, it looks like you've already spent 1.724 million on this, uh, which with the purchasing of the land of 1.7, looks like only 24,000 in probably concept engineering. Okay, that, that's what the document says. I know that the letter, I think, said that it's incorrect. Okay. We can comment on that in a minute. And, and, and I guess that's one of the things that's kind of frustrating is not completing the process and already purchasing the land. Um, that it kind of seems a little bit of uh, the cart before the horse on that. So it just makes this, this decision a lot more difficult, um, unnecessarily difficult. Could we make a comment? Right yeah. Oh, no. no. Oh, they're not now. Oh, that's not. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's one of those, it's, it's a difficult situation where I don't, I don't want to see any, any developer lose uh, money. However, like the, the substantial costs that I see on this, this letter is with the franchise, which can still be reused in a different location. Uh, it's just mainly the purchasing the land before knowing that you could build it on that property. Um, so yeah, I, I'm on the fence. Yeah. Um, Councilman Holden, do you have anything? 
Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. <clears throat> Unmute button. Um, I, I'm supportive of the, you know, moving forward the the five thousand feet. Um, it's really to, in my mind, to you know, we're not opposed to car washes, full service, or tunnels or anything like that. But it's really to protect some of the prime real estate in our city so that things are spaced out. And that's something that perhaps down the road as the city fills up, it can be reevaluated as some of the more prime real estate fills up with different, <laughs> excuse me, different varieties of those type of things. So the way the code's written, um, I, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, to Councilman um, Podeska's point, it is a challenge. I mean, if we were to do a future date, I wouldn't want to do in January. Um, I would think no later than like tomorrow or Thursday if we were going to do an effective date. Because if someone is legitimately that far along, it shouldn't be a problem getting something turned in tomorrow. I, uh, can I add a little bit on that topic? Yeah. Yeah. If it's, All right, if, if it's the appropriate time. I do have a little bit of concern about a future date because we have others. And and so I want to be cautious with that future date. If if you want to go that route, I would want to give the current one the right amount of time without giving so much time that the others have time. Okay. <laughs> Councilman McComber, you had a... I just want, I want a point of clarification. So Stephen, you're okay with the this one because they didn't follow the process and governing <coughs> approvals to give them a car wash in our gateway overlay, but just not oh, the that's, ones. That's kind of a setup. That's not what, <laughs> well, that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what I was saying. What I was saying, saying if we were gonna even we're consider a future date, and I apologize, Councilman McComber, if I cut you off, that there's a little bit of a delay, so my apologies. Go ahead. I'm just saying because the future date, to your point, I mean, if they put an application, we can do it as of today, <coughs> if they have an application in. They, um, their application we always do a completeness review before we accept it and uh, there's a few more items that are needed to be considered a complete application they're very close so for me personally it's just I just I don't want a reward because then we're opening precedents then everyone else comes and says oh I bought land I built this I designed this I spent millions because we know there are many developers in this city who would love to use that against us um, I can name four of them right now but I won't on the record um, who will who 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 actually have an argument even right now? I've spent millions on a water tank, whatever. So I just feel we really need to be careful with that. And then I also failed because this is more than just the car washes. Are we going to talk about the other items as well, like the signage, or are we doing that separately, or we're doing it all at once? It's all it's okay. all in the same item. So so I would like to speak on the signage. Um, I do not want to open up this can. I think we need to keep it to single signage because. You, there's a couple that have already abused it. They've got three and four sets of signs um, on, on their drive-through. And then every, we, if you look, every new building coming in is a drive-through in Saratoga Springs. And now you're looking at two signs constantly. It, it's just, and nowadays too, you obviously can go, if you're not familiar with the restaurant that's there, their menus are online and you're sitting waiting in line. You can easily pull up your cell phone and look up and see what the menu is. It's not like you have to have it there. They're using it to cheat and get another time that they can have their name above it so that they can advertise and have another sign because we have strict sign code, which everyone's breaking already in the city on their buildings. Um, and so for me, I just don't feel comfortable adding that. I have a, on the curbside pickup, I do appreciate that we're gonna have a requirement because they're all junky pieces of paper that are covered in like duct tape and stuff <laughs> to try and, um, how is this affecting our parking requirements? Because they're eliminating seven, eight, 12 spots for a curbside pickup. And then that is no longer allowed for people to park who are going into the restaurant. How are they compliant with our parking standards? I don't think these curbside pickups should be allowed as forcing you to not be able to park there. I think personally that the parking should just be it. And if you're coming to pick something up, you have to park in the back of the parking lot. Okay, you get some exercise before you get your cheeseburger and you walk in, you pick up your cheeseburger and you leave. But I'm so sick of, like, this Cafe Rio already has limited parking. We already made a huge variance for them to get, their, get in there because they were using other parking from Walmart. 
and now they've taken eight spots right in front of the building and saying that you can only park in there. I park in all the time because they can't enforce anything. But, but most people don't know that. But I, I'm, I really don't know how this meets our parking ordinance. That's a good question. I think it's actually infringing upon it. So I really do think that we actually, I don't really want to even approve a park, curbside parking. I would actually want to say that you're not allowed to have a curbside parking or a Uber or Lyft parking. If I could, um, does that mean that you would want this to be additive to their parking requirement? They'd have to have this. So, so if they're adding this, it's, it's additive to the parking requirement. Well, if anything, they're, they're increasing their demand. So they're using all of the parking that people were using inside. Right. Adding additional because they just go in and then leave. Right. He's just saying, like, if they required to have 10 spots, they if they seven. want, they have to have 11. Or if they, if they want, want this. three of them, 13, exactly. Yeah. So, so this is in addition to the required parking for their... I, and, I, and, and if you want to use it as your first three ones right in front of your building, because for some reason people who don't eat in your restaurant are more important than the ones who are taking it home, fine, you can do that. But I say make the people walk, especially if it's an Uber Eats guy. So it, on this particular item, if you're wanting to approve this, then you probably should make that a, um, a clarification in, in an approval. If you're not, I mean, I, I realize you're not in favor of it, but if you did want to approve this tonight, you could make that... Um, additive the condition. It, yeah, well, we definitely need to look at it because I personally think it is infringing on the parking requirements, and so a lot, most of these businesses come within within one or two, right? Barely making their parking requirement, and I've noticed it is a real problem. This little old lady, I told her to just park in the spot the other day. <laughs> so uh, Kevin, you had something you wanted to. Oh, um, I we we moved on past that subject, so maybe okay. maybe I can revisit that, but. But I don't think we. I don't think the parking requirements is up for consideration. So that would just be the direction to the staff to bring bring, bring that back. back. Yeah. Well, we need to or, it because it's But also table this one if you want. If you don't want to signs without the parking requirement coming along with it, okay. they could both. All right, Councilman Karn. <laughs> you were blinking. You no, I'm good. All right. Did you have something? I'm just trying to clear off my list here. I was going to say the same thing that Kevin said. Okay. That we uh, would need to bring that back to you right. if you would it's like. Not on, as it hasn't been done. Okay. All right. Is there any other discussion? Is there any way to clarify some points that no. we discussed that are not, not correct? It's not on the agenda. Unfortunately, no. There's not, not on the agenda. I move that we deny Code Amendment 1905-1980. Regulation City Initiative Citywide Ordinance 22-54, the sections around um, the, um, sorry, I to move to pass five, but remove curbside sign and not allow a second sign on the drive through and maintain the 5,000 um, foot uh, distance on the car wash um, and have it be effective as of the pending ordinance. Okay, I have a first from Councilman Comber. Is there a second? I don't know if I understand it. He says approve it. Basically, it will Pending when the effective the, ordinance. It won't allow the Tommy's. When the pending ordinance went into place a, a while ago. It oh. wouldn't allow the Tommy's Express. It would pull out the, the signage. It wouldn't allow the extra sign on the drive through and it would not. I want the curbside to come back with the parking requirements. So, let's remove that. Oh, it, it went to planning session November 10th. So, there's so the motion came through November 10th. Yeah. Okay. So, planning session is going to be the next Well, the, yeah, I mean, technically, the effective date of the ordinance is when it's published. So, we don't, you can't backdate an we ordinance can't effective date. date. It, However, the pending ordinance doctrine would apply. Um, there is one of the council, I mean, so you can just, the, the motion can fail just because nobody seconded or somebody could second it to just move it forward to a vote. Um, I would like to just mention something quickly about the existing application that was filed and just ask Sarah a couple oh, questions. Okay, okay. can we finish this motion first? Absolutely, yeah. Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails. Um, Kevin, you had something you wanted to add before? Yeah, just part of the discussion about it. I, what kind of application has been filed, Sarah? And, and you're saying that it hasn't been accepted because there's a few, there's some things deficient in the application. With staff. Um, I have a 
because I, I was not aware of an existing uh -huh. application that had been filed. I thought maybe a concept plan had been filed. So you're saying a site plan has been... I, so a concept plan application was filed in August, and then in and we notified the applicant of this code amendment um, last week, and they came, um, and and the gateway overlay uh, locations, and so in that discussion and in that notification, the applicant was. Um, not up to speed on the process. And so the applicant thought their next step was building permit. They, and in our discussion, I clarified the next step is site plan application. And so they submitted the site plan application on Thursday last week, which was December 1st. And then we did our completeness review today and, and they're missing uh, some items that are required. So it's not been accepted yet. Okay. And you haven't received any other applications, correct? We have received inquiries, and we have let one applicant know about this ordinance um, that was interested in submitting a concept application. Okay. I think if you have a definitive rule there with, with the definitive date that that application was filed, where there's no room for ambiguity and it's it's black and white, this application was filed on that date, you can allow that application to proceed. Um, with, But I think there should be some restrictions that you place on there, you know, there needs to be a sunset on that application and, and getting it complete by a certain date. Okay. But I think that that is, the, I think, you have, again, this is a legislative decision, so you have significant discretion when it comes to legislative decision. My um, opinion on completeness of the application is that if we gave the applicant one to two weeks, that that should be adequate to supply those, the remainder of the items. That's my opinion on that. Okay. Quick question, clarification on uh, the signage for those preview signs. Is that per business? So if it's one drive through Per, per drive-through, um, so yes, per business would also be. Per. Okay, so for those kind of buildings that have multiple businesses but share the same drive-through, they could each have a, pre a preview sign? Yeah. They, well, actually, I don't think we clarify. So I think we, sorry, let me get to the language. Um, so per drive-through lane, so we, it wouldn't be per okay. business, it would okay. be per, per, lane. per lane. Some of them do have two lanes. But then they'd have, they could have signs. Yes. So then <laughs> that would mean if they have two lanes, they could have four. So t a preview per lane and a menu board per lane. Can, may, can I ask a question? This is one reason I was struggling with the, the first motion is what's currently allowed? I, I'm like thinking of say, McDonald's, right? They have a drive-through sign on each lane already. Um, are we saying that that's not currently allowed? I, I'm trying to understand the difference between yeah, they're they're allowed one the one main menu board, but not a second like one that says, "Hey, this is the specials." One per lane. Yeah. Well, it, it's. Can I ask why? What's the <laughs> impetus behind this? Because it seems like. It works for the numerous fast food joints that we have in the city, the current. People. We certainly don't have to allow it. We've been getting requests for it, and, and that's why we brought it to you. Is it, is it, cur the rules is it currently it. denied in code? You, you can't have a preview board? They're allowed to have w one sign. <coughs> right now you get code. one menu board per lane, yeah. and so this would allow a preview board in addition. Okay, I can see how different businesses are interpreting this. Because I, I mean, I went to one just the other day that had they do have preview answer. signs in both drive through lanes, and then they had a board next to the window where you order. Oh. They all break the rules. There's, there's all right. A, we do see violations, and we are getting requests. Um, however, whatever you decide is perfectly fine, of course. <laughs> so. Um, I, you know, I'm okay with not approving the preview boards. Um, 
at least now, I mean, we're talking about a six feet in high, six feet in height. Um, a couple things like that. I mean, that's a pretty significant preview board, and I think it's worked for the compliant businesses as is. Um, as far as the, um, what was the other one with the, the, the sign? What is pickup. it called? The parking stall the thing? The curbside pickup signs. Let me go to it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would like to see the ability for them to put something like that up because I think it is a benefit. But um, uh, I, I'm supportive of bringing it back and looking at um, parking requirements at the same time. But I, I mean, to be clear, I, I do think that is, I'm not thinking just curbside pickup, but there's other areas like, you know, like Walmart, where you can go and park in a stall and they'll um, deliver groceries to your car. I mean, that's a pretty substantive service and it was very good for a lot of people during COVID when they didn't want to leave their car during the pandemic and whatnot. Um, but I, I do think evaluating parking, um, especially around if it got out of hand where you're using like eight out of, or, you know, 25% taking up parking or something like that. I, I'm just throwing those numbers out there. That's not direction, but just my thoughts. Okay. Do you want to try? Go ahead. I'll entertain a motion. Okay. <clears throat> I move to approve business item five, code amendment, title 1905 and 1918 regulation city or city initiative, citywide ordinance 2254, dated today with the following changes. Um, I move to strike the language on preview boards entirely. I would like to have staff come back on the curbside signs. And if that means striking it and starting it over with planning, that's what we need to do. And we come back with parking. Come back with parking, yeah, the, with the parking regulations. And on the date. On, the, on this motion, I'd like it be effective on January 1st, 2023. All right, I have a first. Is there a second? <coughs> I'll second. Uh, we have a first from Councilman Kern, a second from Councilman Porter. Is the motion right. clear? Is mud? Is there is there any discuss, further discussion on the motion? Um, I, I mean, I'm comfortable with the motion other than the effective date of pushing it out till yeah. January 1st. I, I mean, can you explain the rationale behind? <laughs> From the discussion in the room um, to allow for certain applications that are very close to be done, staff feels it would take about two weeks. I have a point of clarification maybe. The ones that are pending, if someone brought in an application tomorrow for another car wash that breaks this 5,000 foot, what is the time frame where you have to accept it by? How much time do you have? What's the, what's the state And the application would have to be complete. Once the application has to be complete, let's say it's perfect, and you, what's the time frame that you have to, be, to, have to accept it or not? Uh, well, if, it, if they turn it in and it's complete, they're they're vested. We don't have a time frame. They would be vested on the date that's that very they filed it because we have like two or even three. Because there's another one you don't even know about that I heard about. That's three more that will come in literally because of this loophole we're creating that's for one about. other company. It, we're gonna have three more car washes all within a quarter mile. Fucking quarter mile. You're you're this is actually quarter mile. These are coming in at. If I could. And maybe this is a clarification Kevin could give. Uh, could could the council theoretically um, basically say the applications they currently have and um, that they've currently received as of today's date, but then say it's grandfathered, they have 14 days from today to complete their application? Anyone that satisfactory. The, the, and, and anyone that we receive. I, absolutely. I think we can add that to the ordinance application. Okay. Yeah. Receive. I'm going to amend my first. Does and it, and also add clarification that they have a week to uh, make that a complete application. Okay, so I'll amend my first to make the ordinance uh, effective as of publishing date. I want to do two. And any applications that are currently in process have a 14-day window to to complete their application. 
14 business day. Yeah. All right, I've amended first, and I will amend my second. To maintain their current day. Yeah. To maintain their current application. Update. All right, can we not do business days, calendar days? Calendar days. Okay. <laughs> so business day, that would be like three weeks. <laughs> That's what I was yeah. getting at, Kevin. Okay. <laughs> you said business. I think you meant I was getting under. at business days, yeah. so yeah. So I was, uh, okay, well. Oh, okay, you did mean that. I'm sorry. I thought you meant 14 calendar. <laughs> he was doing it so that it takes it through. To so it takes it through the, the, same per, the same point, yeah. So I, so I amend my motion to say any current applications have until January 1st. Any, anybody who currently has an application that's being worked, that's being okay. worked on. Okay. Amended second. Can, I, I know you're saying this by default of what you're saying, but can we specify that no further applications will be considered that aren't conformant with this? Yeah, so the motion is that um, today. as of today, as of, as of adoption, it takes effect except for any application that's in process. And can we confirm that there's only one right now? In process. We have one in process. We have a second one, but it's outside of this 5,000 feet. So we have a second one that is um, uh, South, no. so it's outside of. It, it, would it, it would comply anyway. Right, they would. We have a second one that would comply. Right. No. With that, did you did you want to put a distance to residential existing residential housing? We can't. We can't. Mm. That's to go back. We do want them to. Do we that. do want them to bring that back. back. Yeah. So you're directing us to bring that. Yes. Back. Yeah. Okay. Yep. For future applications. Okay. And. Uh, that's not, I'll, okay, I'll is there any further discussion? Councilman Podesca? Aye. Councilman Wilden? Aye. Councilman McComber? Nay. Councilman Karn? Aye. Councilman Porter votes aye. M motion passes four to one. It, now that the motion's ended, I, I think looking at distance from residential, marrying something like what we did with the hotel would be a good, or a hotel space would be a good starting spot. You probably could almost mirror it, to be honest. I think because that accomplished what we wanted with that. Compliance with that one too. <laughs> Sorry, what? I'm just joking that this Tommy's Express Car Wash would be against that new motion, that new ordinance as well, because it's so good residents. Um, okay, uh, business item six, Code Amendment Title 10, 10 and 1011, nuisance. <laughs> We remove the 1011, the snow removal, not yet. Okay. We're, we're going to, okay. though. You, so you, so oh, don't, okay. don't okay. talk okay. about it. Okay. I won't even. <laughs> I'll just skip that then. Um, so, I, just, I saved myself the breath here. Um, so what I'm bringing before you today is some clarification to the current weed code, um, changing some definitions, exactly what weeds are, um, I, I felt that the, and staff felt that the, the code was kind of ambiguous. It didn't leave a whole lot of, what is a weed? Is it a dandelion? Is it just tall grass in your front yard? What exactly is a weed? Um, so we're changing, uh, we're striking some of the language that's currently in there, uh, adding in a, two de new definitions for injurious weeds and noxious weeds. Um, those are definitions that I pulled right from the state code. Um, just to help mirror state code. And then uh, one of the bigger changes also is adding in a definition for a defensive strip uh, that's currently not there. Uh, one of the issues that we're seeing or that I'm dealing with quite frequently is vacant lots throughout the city. Um, and I'm not speaking of the large lots that are up on the hillside. These are in residential neighborhoods that just haven't been built on yet, um, where it's still native ground, untouched, it's just growing native right now. The, the issue is, is that the weeds are growing on the property. Some of them are injur injurious or the noxious weeds, the invasive species that we definitely, we want to try and get rid of those if we can. Um, uh, oh, oh, 
Sorry. I'll let you do it. You can touch it. Um, uh, so, so injurious weeds, I, I know you can read, but uh, for anybody in the I audience, can. it's really it. small. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the definition I've, I've come up with means plants of any type growing in an uncultivated oh, state, so not used for food, fiber, or ornamentation, extending in height greater than six inches above ground, including without limitation, tumbleweeds. Yes. Yes. Yes, actually, thistle is actually considered a noxious weed. So, large private entities who like to grow natural grasses that are full of thistle would fall under this. Yes, and that would not be allowed. This is a clarification to the current code. So, um, yeah. so actually, if you look at uh, okay. D, what's going to What's be hopefully changed to D, um, it actually shows um, thistle right there as II, Russian thistle. Okay. Is, is included specifically on that list. Yeah, there, my bag. And, and that hasn't changed. That, that list is in the current code. So we're keeping that and just kind of changing up some definitions. Um, so one of the issues um, that we've come across is those unimproved vacant lots, specifically within residential neighborhoods. Um, they just kind of, they're an absentee owner, they live out of state, they have no interest in building yet, they're trying to hold out for a better market, you know, whatever it is. Um, they're not really taking care of the property. And so what, what, we're, what I'm attempting to do here is to say, you still have to maintain it, you still have to chop down and get rid of the noxious weeds, serious weeds, keep the sidewalks clear. And part of this is, um, the first part of this, this defensive strip around the perimeter of the property to help keep those weeds and any kind of fire potential hazards, hopefully to a minimum, by requiring them to keep a bare strip of land. What was the definition of a defensive strip? How wide is it? Uh, it, it is, I want to say it was five. I thought I had a distance. It is, is it in there somewhere? Uh, right there. Six. I mean, I don't want to open a gigantic can of worms here, but we have a large golf course. This would make a major impact on how they operate and landscape. Correct. But they are a big source of a lot of the problems that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody in particular in a public meeting. but A golf course. We're not saying There's which a, golf course. A, <laughs> there are property owners that are not doing their part with yeah. this current code. Um, and so... When I, when I try to enforce this code as it is currently written without these changes, it's very difficult because one of the challenges is the way the code is currently written, one of the things on here is um, any parcel of undeveloped property of five continuous acres. Um, so we're starting to talk about the hillsides. Mm -hmm. Right now, technically speaking, if I enforce on you with your quarter acre lot and residential development, I up on the hillside and tell them they need to cut down all their weeds too. Yeah. And so it, it's technicality, right? There's no way that somebody's going to agree to cut down weeds on an undeveloped lot on the hill. On five um, so obviously the, the five acres was targeting those larger lots that are undeveloped specifically on the hillside. Um, uh, so this would also require that defensive strip around the perimeter of the property. And this is targeting those interior lots in the residential developments. I just, I just had a thought come to my mind about this. I've, I've looked at this before, but one, one thing that I was thinking about is a wildland urban interface code in, the, in our fire code, which we adopted, might have rules that are um, require a larger buffer than this. So if, if you decide to pass this, I would say except as otherwise provided in the international uh, or the wildland urban interface code. Um, or we can, we can tweak the language to basically say whichever is more restrictive. So if it's, if it's 25 feet, they have to do 25. In some cases, it's 100 feet. I got it, you got it. Yeah, I wrote it. Okay. <laughs> All right, any other questions from council? Councilman Wilden, anything? I'll entertain Not on this one. Sorry. sorry. I'll entertain a motion. I move. Oh, to, sorry, Stephen. Sorry. I, 
Man, Michael, I'm sorry. I keep cutting you off. That's not on purpose. Um, we didn't talk about the snow removal, but I presume we're, I, I mean, we're I'm gonna not. Pull it. We're pulling 1011. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sorry. No problem. I move to approve code amendment title 10.10.02, 10.10.03, and remove 10.10.02. Do you have a second? Nuisance city initiated citywide ordinance 22 55 dated today with all staff findings and conditions with an additional condition that states that any buffer is that's more restrictive in comparison to the wildlife urban interface code and what we're talking about today is enforced wild land wild land not wild, oh, wild land urban interface i have a first do i have a second second I have a second, a uh, first from Councilman Conver, a second from Councilman Karn. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on the motion? Councilman Podeska. Aye. Councilman Wilden. Aye. Councilman McComber. Aye. Councilman Karn. Aye. Councilman Porter votes aye. The motion passes unanimously. Business item seven, code amendment title 190910, minimum parking commercial kennel. Before we move to that item, could we get clarification on the motion regarding the car wash spacing, specifically clarification on the um, how much, so the effective date is today, however, how much time do current applicants have to? Um, Until January 1st. January 1st. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, if they have I thought the motion was 14 days. He That's what I remember voting on was 14 days on an amendment. Motion to January 1st. And only for active applications. Thank you. Okay. You, you did say 14 days, remember? And Kevin asked And then about, it was changed. But then he modified no, and made what? a modified a motion with the January 1st. I thought, I thought the 14 days was subsequent to that because it was originally January 1st. It was January 1st, then he went to 14 days, and then Kevin said, is it calendar days or business days? And it was 15 business days, which puts it to January 1st. Okay, thanks. Just remember this, this to Sarah's comment, the fact that David an ordinance is not the date you pass it, it's the date it's published. So... Cindy usually gets it published the next day. It just has to be on the public notice website. So it's never the effective date. It's the effective day is never the day of. Unless we have, unless we have pending ordinance. Yeah, unless there's a pending Which ordinance. Which we did have on this. But of course, that's, yeah, exactly. Different but we have that on this, so. We could do any day, really. Okay. Business item seven, I believe we're ready for you. Great. Uh, staff has received a request from the public to amend our minimum parking requirements for commercial kennel to change the current requirement from four stalls per 1,000 square feet of building space to two stalls per 1,000 square feet of building space. Uh, the applicant has provided some information and staff has done some research as well. Uh, just a summary, the you know, parking requirements can vary quite widely depending on different use definitions, different zones, you know, public transportation, you know, density of the communities, you know, shared parking, nuisances. Some jurisdictions just deal with commercial parking solely on nuisances with be odor, uh, lighting, or noise. And they also vary with their parking requirements on how much retail sales they uh, that occur, if it's incidental or if it's uh, you know over a certain amount, then they require more parking. Uh, it's fairly frequent that jurisdictions use uh, daycare use in comparison with uh, a commercial kennel. The thought or practice has been that don't say that too loud. <laughs> customers. <laughs> <laughs> Customers uh, frequent the business about the same times and the same durations as a daycare. Uh, well, they are their fur babies. Isn't that what right. they're <laughs> and then uh, staff looked at a comparison of what other parking requirements 
that Utah cities have for a commercial kennel. Uh, very few of them have like a commercial kennel definition, but they use like a daycare. And generally speaking, our ordinances are more in line with our current code. Excuse me, our, our other jurisdictions are more in line with our current code than the proposed amendment. However, staff also looked at jurisdictions that have a particular requirement for commercial kennels and also looked at uh, jurisdictions that have this pet suites, uh, commercial kennels throughout the country. There's about 68, and there's this one, and they're, they're also working for with Layton. And generally speaking, their parking requirements for jurisdictions that have a specific requirement for commercial kennel or jurisdictions that currently have a pet suites are more in line with the proposed amendment of two stalls per 1,000 square feet. Uh, the applicant is here and would be glad to address any questions you might have, and I would as, as well. Um, Councilman. Oh, I, I failed to mention the Planning Commission uh, just considered this item last Thursday and recommended approval. <laughs> okay, Councilman Card, yeah. Well, as I was gonna say, do we want to have the applicant address first and then we'll, then we'll take our questions? Their choice, what they would rather. Yeah, I'd love to add a little bit to oh. what Ken said. This is Joanna Graham with Kimley Horn. Um, so I just want to thank Ken again. He did a great job researching this site. We are proposing a reduction in the parking stalls really because of the operational use of this facility. Um, so like Kent mentioned, a lot of jurisdictions around the area do allow this facility to use a daycare use for their parking requirements. Um, this facility does not have like a retail component, so it's not like the Petco here that also does dog boarding. This is strictly dog daycare and dog boarding. So the applicants or the um, users really are coming to the site, dropping off their dog. They're there for five minutes and then they leave. Um, there are five employees at the site. So with what we're proposing, we're proposing 27 stalls. So with five employees, that's like allowing for 22 different people to drop, drop off their dog in the same five-minute window. Um, I have a dog. I drop them off at daycare. I've never seen that many people. So just kind of thinking about that logistically, the reason that we're providing less parking, like I said, is because the operational use, and that allows us to have a larger facility for the dogs. We have a large outdoor area, um, so the dogs can run around outside. So it kind of provides the balance that we need operationally to have a good environment for the dogs. I will say that Planning Commission did bring up some concerns for the future, so I want to address those as well. Pet Suites is signing a 20-year lease for this site, so we want to be here long term. That's our goal, um, and I think this is a use that your community would benefit from. Um, I know someone at Planning Commission takes their dog 30 minutes away to drop them off. Um, so I think this would be a benefit to the community. We also did look into um, if someone were to purchase the site in 20 years when the lease was up, how they could retrofit that building and get rid of the outdoor area to provide more parking. And so if someone were to do that in the future, they are able to meet a three to one parking ratio, three stalls per 1,000 square feet, and keep that existing building, just removing the outdoor area. Okay, Council so, Garden. Where is your location? Do you have the... Is it nowhere Concept in the plan? packet? Did it have a map? Where... Just east of the proposed Tommy's car wash. Yes. So Just right over here. Okay. Other businesses that are coming in will use some of their spots. So I went back and watched the entire planning commission. Yes, it was riveting. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I really technically don't have a problem with the reduction um, overall. I do have a question. Can we, can we make a reduction uh, conditioned on the use? And if the use changes, we require it to go back? That's, our, that's already in the code. If, they, if somebody comes in with a different use, they have to... So the only the way, parking. okay, so, okay, so then no. if, we can't reduce. if it's a, the change of use code says that they have to comply with, with uh, the parking requirements. 
So if it if it changed from what are, what are well, we, we approve it for a commercial kennel? kennel at two, if someone comes in twenty years from now or mm -hmm. or whatever, and they want to make it a or they won't a bank, to... yeah, they've got to rec they've got to be compliant with bank parking, right? Yeah. Okay. So so we kind of have an interesting dilemma. Over the weekend, we, we learned very quickly that a grocery store doesn't necessarily meet the needs of a, a gym. gym. Um, and, and so 4 a.m. packed. Right. So, so again, that's the theoretical That's the theoretical problem that we see in the future is how do we address that? And so they have to probably limit, you know, storefront or whatever in, in the future use. So that they have complied, so it, it might limit that facility. Uh, but again, it's it's uh, you know they've obviously done some research, and it's just something that people. So we're just changing the requirement only for commercial kennel. Any future use would have to be compliant with their use. Yeah. But say an account goes in and retrofits this building in twenty years, they probably would be more than adequate with that part of the requirement. Right. And are you short-term and long-term so, boarding? Yes, we do both. Okay. That, that was my other question. Is because the my major hang up is the change of use. the The fact that you're signing a twenty year lease makes me feel good, but you know you things happen. Fast. Things happen um, in five years. But do we do have other uses that would park at this level? Like it, this would this wouldn't be two, and the, this is now the minimum, and everybody else needs four. The only one that I found in our parking code was a financial institution. So a bank would be okay. There's also two. Parking stalls per 1,000 square feet of building. And I will say we did look into it, and we can meet the three, or like a future use can meet three, like I said, right. removing the outdoor space and fence area. Councilman McConberg, sorry, you were next. So I have a question about this, is where this is located. That's why it was so important for me is because it's next to other commercial uses that we require the four, but they get seven or eight. And you have shared parking, and that's why we, we stuck with four, because six years ago, maybe it was seven years ago, we had this conversation. We reduced our stalls per square foot from five to four because we have shared parking. You're at Smith's parking lot, you're because it's really bad over in the corner by Mod Pizza. It's horrible because it's like very, it doesn't meet the parking requirement because we allow them to use the parking stalls in front of the Smith's ga the gas station and other parts, right? And, and we allow them to have that and allow those building businesses. If a, it's not because Chick-fil-A is coming somewhere else, but if In-N-Out Burger wanted to come into development, we're screwed. <laughs> so like I can't punish one business because another business actually takes more than four per 1,000 square feet, but the whole reason we lowered it from five to four is... For that exact reason, shared parking is what's allowed. This is a 50% reduction. Currently, our daycare, is it two or three? I believe it's or do we four. Do, we still require our daycare to do four, and we have a daycare that we just approved on As Alpine Boulevard, isn't it? That's Aspen right? Hills Boulevard. Aspen Hills Boulevard. Um, and we, they have like the, their buses, and we were concerned about them parking their buses and taking up parking spots and all these things. Um, do you, so Mike, I'll have his, his looking that up. My question for you is, do you have, um, do you offer any pickup where you drive and pick up and bring people, does everyone have to bring their pets to you or do you offer a, a valet service and go pick them up? Everyone drives their dogs to the location. So you won't have like other vehicles that are not employee vehicles that are there that are used to deploy anything? Correct. That is, That's yeah. really good. That would be a real concern. But the daycare is for? No. Sarah's confirming that. Daycare is one stall per staff member or volunteer at the highest shift, plus one stall per five students present at one time. How many students? So it depends on occupancy and staff level. So that's more uh, school than a daycare. Yeah. Well, we possible to force like we have to. Yeah. Like, how, we have to how know. Have ever pass that, and I, I take blame for that because I think that I was on the time when that came through. But are we going to really go there and count? I feel bad for our code enforcement. He's over there looking like a pervert counting kids in the <laughs> playground. <laughs> no, they do have, um, based on um, state code requirements, they do have m maximum 
occupancy, um, maximum student to teacher ratios and sizes and uh, classroom sizes and things. So um, they are able to provide us this information, but it is. How do we know that there's only it is different in the building? Yeah. So for me, I I'm okay with again another reduction. I'm concerned because businesses go bankrupt all the time. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm on a board. We signed a lease, five year lease. The company went under after one year, and then another business came in that had a much higher use. Bankruptcy voids contracts. That's how the United States works. But they could only get to three. But I. With the site use as well, if it was... Exactly, but then we're creating blight. We're creating a spot that can never be used. Then, because if it's a, like another business well, comes in, they have to cut off and bar off and wall off part of Or bear, bar, like board off part, part of their square footage and can't access it at all. I mean, there's different things they can do. But it, it, sorry, is the outdoors part of their counted square footage, is that why getting rid of the outdoor would make them no, they're just, just because you could put parking spots where the outdoor is? Okay. Right. I just want to clarify. I will say, too, the site is large enough that if a smaller building were to go in there, like a restaurant facility, there's plenty of space to meet a different use. It's not like the size of the site is too small. In our, in our regional commercial, we do we allow um, fenced, basically, dog lot. That's a, this is basically a fenced dog park. It's a permitted, it's a permitted use. The commercial kennel is a permitted use in the regional commercial zone. But do they have a permitted use to have a dog park, a fenced dog park, outside their building in our regional commercial? If I was a restaurant next door, I don't know if I'd be very excited about that. Could we allow that? Right now it's looking like Tommy's will be next door. On the other side. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we don't address that in the code right now. So if... Um, but, it, but allowing an outdoor dog, I mean, that's mm -hmm. people who have fear of dogs, people, I mean, this is, everyone has said dog lovers, but there are a lot of people who have phobias of dogs. And so do we allow a, basically a dog park in our regional yeah. commercial? Could I... We, uh, so it's not, it's not specifically in the code. However, with um, commercial kennels and some vet offices, we these on the site plan. So it... Even though it's not in the code, it is typical with this type of use. So, so we can certainly discuss whether or not that's a concern. I guess we don't have the site plan. Yet, but my concern would be what kind of fencing we have. We do have a concept plan. Has has that? Is it screened fencing? We didn't have any. Yeah, we had no it's completely screened, and I think it's like six feet tall. Okay. We didn't have any pictures, any location in the packet. It was no. literally just the bunch. Well, it's because we, we're not well, approving right. the site plan. It's exa yes, this for right. citywide. It's not necessarily a site plan. So, but we have some render renderings right here. You can look at. Let me. What we're making right. this change for all kennels. Now, when their competitor comes in down it by, you know, off of Pioneer Crossing, you know, that's another kennel. That do we really want that even in our gateway ordinance? I mean, th this is just. It, I don't know if an right. outdoor dog park is what we wanted in our gateway. I just, I, I feel like it was a waste of my time, and I'm just really pissed about how the gateway ordinance is just being thrown under the rug. Can I address some issues? Um, I don't know how we regulate this, except for like nuisances, and that's a challenge to do that with code enforcement. Um, but I, I've had experience of uh, permitting commercial kennels and other jurisdictions where I've worked and I would be glad to live right next to some of them. It's not so much what you do, but how you do it. I fear of dogs. I do. I'm no, 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 no. afraid of dogs. It, the, I was attacked by a dog when I was seven years old, and when people are walking their dogs without, I mean, I'm not saying this, but yeah. I have a very strong fear of dogs. If I see a dog that's out and that these dogs can get out, that's a very big fear for me. And there are a lot of people who have this phobia. It's a very strong phobia, and I have one. I'm not going to deny this. If we don't have in our code that we can't have an outdoor kennel, but I'm not comfortable with reducing by 50% parking when you're going to have other businesses that are going to be, and there's like, what, six plots in this whole strip mall area? And so I don't feel comfortable reducing so substantially, but again, I'm one of five, but that's just where I'm at. I'm not going to stop the, but I'm just, if we don't have in code that we can't, that we can allow people to have every business who wants to have an outdoor dog run in their little fencing area, 
then we probably need to look into something like that because we don't want that every but and especially i don't know if i would have wanted that in the gateway either so because the fence can't be chain link can't be chain link i don't know if you know that it has to be a solid material um, it could be vinyl or whatever cement but this is just i'm just extremely frustrated today because it feel like why do we even do things as a city council when we just disregard it we just throw it under and we just allow people because they put in their little sob story and so i'm just extremely frustrated today and i will be for probably the first time in my 13 years i will be going on social media and letting everyone know what happened today are there any other sorry thanks uh so questions with the uh parking requirements for other possible tenants in the future is our thresholds basically two per thousand and then it jumps to four do we have any within the three range and so the three is a moot point right right um and and so that my my concern is you know with just with the parking is that it, it creates a structure that in the future has to always be a kennel then right or a bank yes uh, we, uh, under our current code, that would be the case. I think the applicant's saying, though, that there's more room on the site, so. To, to only take it to three, though. There's more four. landscaping, for instance, than is required by the code. They could convert landscaping to parking. I, I don't know the site well enough to. Right, but she said she could only get to three, and so three doesn't get us anywhere because no businesses can come in. That, that's taking out all the landscaping, yeah. Yeah, so my, my decision is going to be based on that. Okay. Councilman Wilden, do you have anything you want to add to the discussion before we take a motion? Um, uh, just around the discussions, I think what Councilman Tedesco was saying is the problem changing it here, it changes in all sorts of places, but also it, it, it really limits what it can be in the future. Um, I understand like, you know, the, the volume may not be super high here of traffic, but there's a lot of buildings going around it. And we did spend a lot of time around parking um, <clears throat> in these, these type of areas. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion. I move that Code Amendment Title 19.09.10 required minimum parking for commercial kennel, Joanna Graham, Kimley Horn, and Associates Applicant Citywide Ordinance 22-56 dated today requesting to go from four per 1,000 to two per 1,000 um, remain at four stalls. So you're, you're oh. moving to deny the, the, the Code Amendment? Code amendment. I second. I have a first from Councilman McComber, a second from Councilman Podeska. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Councilman Podeska. Aye. Councilman Wilden. Aye. Councilman McComber. Aye. Councilman Karn. No. Councilman Porter. Aye. Uh, the motion passes 4-1. Okay, uh, so again, um, this is changing some definitions, adding some, um, and more clarifying and um, trying to clean up the code. Um, so we're, you can see in the yellow, the highlighted areas there, um, the, the strikeout areas just before that, those were the edits um, from Planning Commission that they suggested uh, we take a look at and potentially change some things. Um, what we're doing here is changing the definition of a trailer sign and a vehicular sign. Um, means any fixed sign applied, set upon, painted on, or printed on a trailer. Also happens for vehicles. And visible from any from the public street 
unless the trailer or vehicle is used for transporting materials or uh, people in the normal day-to-day -day operations of a business. And adding a storage trailer definition uh, means a trailer that's used for storage of items at the same or adjacent site, location, parcel, or property for more than 72 hours. Um, can you? Uh, my clicker's not working. Can you go to the next slide, please, Sarah? Oh. My clicker's not working for some reason. Now try it. Oh, no? Okay. Oh, oh, skipping. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> stop touching stuff over there. Um, <laughs> so um, that's the first section of the code, just adding and changing, clarifying some definitions. Um, and then in 1918-04, this is the prohibited sign section. Um, a simple edit to Q was in the current code, we had a vehicular definition and then prohibited vehicle sign. So it's just clarifying keeping same terminology. Um, Planning Commission had uh, comments about the second half of Q and R where it says, or occupying required parking for more than 50% of the operating hours. Um, they had concerns regarding what exactly does that mean? And where is that allowed and not allowed? And so after talking with uh, legal and uh, planning director, um, we we kind of talked about what exactly does that mean? What does that what does that mean for enforcement? Does that open the door for somebody to um, potentially um, the scenario that we foresaw in planning commission uh, mentioned was in a scenario similar to a large box store, pick one, Walmart, Smiths, Costco, any of them, um, where they have an excess of parking stalls. Would this open the door then by changing the definitions in the code uh, to allow them to park a vehicle or a trailer sign in those excess parking stalls? And that's obviously not the intent here. That's not what we're trying. We're, we're, we're trying to nix that. So um, after some discuss, actually a lot of discussion, um, we, we decided to add um, parking stalls to both of those. Um, so it clarifies that um, if a vehicle or a trailer is parked in a parking stall, a, a, and designated does not mean that it's specifically designated for that business or for that use. If it's lined and it's a parking stall, it is a required parking stall, and they would not be allowed to park it there for more than 50% of the operating hours. Um, there is a few particular businesses that are in the business currently um, they do pickups, drop-offs, transfers uh, for their particular business. Um, the, the one that comes to mind is down here on Redwood Road. They have a delivery van that is branded with their business name and things on the side of it. And they, the, the whole intent here was they were parking it in front of their store in a drive through lane, not in a designated parking stall and again, using it as a mobile billboard. So they were parking it there for days. So um, the, the, what we're trying to do here is that's not okay. So, um, and then U is a new section um, that pertains specifically to tra storage trailers. Um, it says that a prohibited sign is a sign affixed to applied, set upon, or painted on, or printed on a storage trailer. Um, and just for clarification, so hopefully this is what we're this is what we're trying to avoid is this particular type of scenario where we have a developer in the city that with the way the current code is written, they kind of have an argument. Um, we allow storage trailers with development. Um, they can store building materials, concrete blankets, hammers, tools, whatever. Um, and the argument is, is that a trailer sign or is that a storage trailer? And so they, the, we've, they kind of have a valid argument both ways. We say it's a trailer sign, they say it's storage. Who's right, who's wrong? So uh, with the changes to the code, we're trying to clarify this is not acceptable um, and, would not, and would be prohibited. Hey Brad, the, when you mentioned that language about stalls, that's not in the packet. Oh, it's not. I want to revisit that. I don't know how that didn't. Well, this one here. No, it's, yeah, this right. just went to 
Planning Commission December 1st. And so these are not in the packet. So that's why they're highlighted. So the highlighted language is not in the packet. And it's highlighted because you're seeing that tonight. We had a quick turnaround on this item because uh, we just have the one council meeting in December. So I have a question. On the neon signs in residential zones, um, there's another section with prohibited signs in commercial because we don't allow neon signs in commercial. Why does it say specifically neon signs are restricted in only residential zones? We looked into that further on the commercial. Our code is not clear on that. As so this is what's currently in the code. So we can certainly add that to clarify. And we, we have a we have a on our list to bring that topic to you specifically. We we don't have that for you tonight, but we do we are keeping track of everything that needs to be done and we do know that that needs to be brought back to you. So depending on how long it's gonna take, I would like to see we have so many new businesses coming in. Um, we've had some businesses put in neon accents, not the actual sign, but like their other things that are on, around the sign. And actually, I don't mind that, but we don't want to have it look like, you don't want the flashing open sign, but you also don't want the, the, the sign itself being neon because it shows it's very bright and it's very hard to candle those and measure those. So if we could do something quickly to make sure that we don't end up with a lot of neon wraps and neon flashing. And I mean, a perfect example is like, we probably, while you're doing this, we have a business that decided to put Christmas lights on their building, on a commercial building. We've never had that before. And it's, they're not, it's, they're hanging, they're, they're not in line, they're like falling off. And, but where do we have a code? What is the code for allowing Christmas lights? And then, do they have to take them off? Do they, what's their limit? I'm just talking about um, Paula Burger put Christmas lights on their whole building. Like uh, the old outline. Yeah, they put them on their tree. It does, yeah. But I, and I'm just saying, but do we have an ordinance that has to be well maintained because they are all falling off of the Apollo building. And what's the time frame? Sure. I don't know if we have that. So these are the kinds of things like we're just getting bigger, we're just getting more businesses. We just want to make sure that we're staying on top of these. I really appreciate the cleaning and the getting clarification to help you be more effective as you're going around talking. And as we can, if we had this every two months where what's your biggest hangups and we're trying to clean those kinds of things up for you. I'm all in favor of having these types of meetings if we have to have them that frequently to get you able to um, enforce the intent of trying to make a nice city. Um, you want to see more restrictive city, go to Park City. We're not even close to what they do there and they don't seem to have a problem. Um, and businesses like to complain that we're so restrictive. Well, when they go to Park City, you don't see a McDonald's look like any other McDonald's in the world, uh, the McDonald's in Park City. So I appreciate the efforts and uh, appreciate the cleanup here. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I'm all for the intent of, and my question, and it may be addressed and I didn't see it, and I talked to Mark about this, is what do we do with the framer who parks his trailer in front of a lot for three to four weeks, and he's got his framing company logo on it, and he's storing his tools there, and the, the trailer doesn't move for a month, and it's got his logo. He's got a banner storage trailer, and he's in violation. So, oh, there we go. Um, so that was actually a concern also of the Planning Commission. Okay. Um, the answer to that was um, legal. Uh, Fred weighed in on that and said that I do have some discretion when it comes to enforcing the code. So am I going to drive by in, at three days in a row and look at that specific trailer? Probably not in all realistic you know, settings. So, but if I, if I see it and it's been... And, like this one trailer that I that I had the the illustration there. Yep. It hasn't moved in probably a year. So okay. that's that that's what we're trying that's what I'm trying to I get to, the intent but right. if you cite that person can they come back and say well you don't equally enforce your law. Can I can I speak? I I'm a bit uncomfortable with with this decision being deferred to a, a legal decision that was made at the planning commission stage. So 
Right now, I, I will say this, when it comes to staff decisions, there should be no discretion. Okay, so the staff decision is called a ministerial decision, and there should be very, very little discretion. Um, a planning commission and, a, and an administrative decision made at a city council level, there is some discretion built into an administrative decision. A staff decision is not, unless it's a planning director decision, is not an administrative that is a ministerial decision. So any any decision that's made by Brad, we there can't be any really. So he can't have ambiguity. He has to enforce it across. So the if floor. you're if you're concerned about this not being clear, then it should be tabled and be brought back with they those, the clarification. Um, the only thing that addresses that is just this definition. It says unless the vehicle is used for trans transporting people or materials in the normal day to day operation. That's, that's so, hold hopefully on. what... Where did you just read? Where was that at? That's under the, the vehicle. vehicle. Visible from the pod. You're talking about a vehicle sign, right? So I'm talking about... Or a storage the framer, trailer. The framer who bought, you know, a 15-foot a trailer. Oh, a trailer, okay. And he's got his... He keeps his, all of his compressors and, and air power tools in there at night to cut down on cost of framing the place so they don't have to haul that off every single day. They're there for a month framing a house. Okay. And he's got his company logo on the side of it. Well, and he's so in violation of this new rule. The, then, no, then the distinction would that. be, they would be the, the top definition trailer sign, but these um, other ones would be a storage trailer. So th that's the how distinction. You, you, uh, the point is, is how do you tell the difference? One, one trailer's parked there for a month, Storing stuff. storing stuff for a month. And, and one, part, one is a 18-wheeler Right. And I'm all for this new code. Right. I think we need to have a carve-out for what I'm talking about. Right. For, for Well, because, well, but yeah. developers are contractors too, right? I mean... Well, but then we, then we, all we do is elevate the cost of building a house too. Can I, can I throw you a really cool curveball? and then make the request that we just table this for tonight. Um, theoretically, we, we might have a, a small orchestra trailer with the city logo on the side. According to this code, we couldn't keep it parked in our parking lot. <laughs> so might I suggest we, we I thank you very much for your time and feedback and let us work on it and bring it back to you at a later meeting. Do you want a motion? Yeah, I'll entertain a motion. I move to table business item eight. Code Amendment Title 19021918, Trailer Signs City Initiated Citywide Ordinance 2257, dated today, uh, with the direction to bring back um, some clarity to serve the spirit of what we're trying to get at. Second. I have a first from Councilman Karn, a second from Councilman Podeska. Is there any further discussion on the item? Councilman Podeska. Aye. Councilman Wilden. Aye. Councilman McComber. Aye. Councilman Karn. Aye. Councilman Porter votes aye. Uh, we do have need for closed session. Recess. Uh, I, okay. Um, we'll take a five-minute recess and then move into closed session. Okay.